for that uh, generous um, introduction, although I would point out that it's uh, con con concurrent uh, experience, not a consecutive experience that I've had. Um, but uh, I'd like to invite, if I could, all the panellists to, to join me um, here. Uh, while they're joining us, I'd say that it's a real privilege to join you here today to see so many um, friends and colleagues from here and overseas joining us for this very important conversation this, this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to congratulate Professor Flake and all at the Perth USA Centre for organising this discussion. And what I'll do first, I've got some opening remarks, but I'd like to introduce our very distinguished panel here today. Our first is uh, Dr Dino Jalal who is a career diplomat and a former Indonesian Deputy Foreign Minister. He's also the founder of the Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, an independent, non-political organisation focused on international relations. Welcome very much, sir. Our second panellist is Vice Admiral Koda, who is a Japanese naval officer with over 30 years uh, career in the maritime defence. He's an academic writer and also a senior fellow at the Asia Centre of Harvard University. And he's also a former Commander-in-Chief of the Japanese Maritime Self-Defence Force. Welcome, sir. Our third panellist is Vice Admiral Anup Singh, who retired from the Indian Navy after four decades of service, retiring as the Flag Officer Commanding-in-Chief of the Eastern Naval Command. He's also an expert in maritime security in the Indo-Pacific and also in the blue economy. Welcome, sir. Our fourth is Professor uh, Dingli Shen. Uh, professor Shen is a Professor of International Relations at Fudan University. He is the Deputy Dean of Institute of International Studies and the Director of the Centre for American Studies at Fudan University. He specialises in regional and international security and also nuclear relations between China and the USA. As you can see here, we have a very distinguished panel and thank you all very much for joining us. Australia's future is a shared one with our regional neighbours. It always has been and it always will be. And I think as a politician particularly, no matter the irritations and the distractions that occur from time to time within all our nations, but also sometimes between our nations, no nation in the zone will experience and also maintain long-term peace and prosperity if we do not work together in our common interest, in our common political interest, and also in the interest of maintaining the blue economy. Our Australian Chief of Navy said at the last Sea Power Conference here in Australia, I just wanted to quote from him because I think he's captured the situation we're looking at today very well. He said this, increasing regional and global connection means no state can expect to act alone to bear the burdens of security and stability. We must look to those things that unite us rather than those things that differentiate us as we work together to advance good order and observance of legal norms at sea. And at the same time, we must leverage the, cap the capability differences between us to deliver our common purpose. This whole of government and whole of nation engagement is not new, and Senator Wong referred to that in her speech. But if we take a look back further, during World War II, our leaders such as Menzies, Churchill and Roosevelt clearly understood from their experiences in the post-world, in the unsuccessful post-World War I reconstruction, that both economic prosperity and security were required for ongoing political stability. And in 1942, Robert Menzies, a former Australian Prime Minister, made this observation. A world war makes us a world nation, not a parochial community, but a world community. Nothing so contributes to peace amongst men as the ordinary, decent commercial relations. And these relations can only be restored by, the statesman, by statesmanship when this war is over. And these sentiments from 1942 were captured, I think, very eloquently by George Marshall in a 1947 speech he gave on what would become the Marshall Plan. He said this, it is logical that the United States should do whatever it can to assist in the return of the normal health, economic health of the world, without which there can be no political st stability 
and no assured peace. As we all know here, this shared belief dominated post-World War Reconstruction, diplomacy and trade relationships between all our nations. Despite regular conflicts, since then, the world has prospered and as a result, avoided another world war. But there is no cause for complacency, as we've already heard from many of the speakers this morning. Political stability today is just as reliant on economic prosperity and security as it was during the last World War. The long-term maintenance of this peace and stability and economic development can never and should never be taken for granted. Political stability in all in the zone countries rely some way on maritime trade and freedom of movement within the blue zone. Without it, none of us can maintain political stability. So I believe with increasing pressures in our zone, as you've heard from speakers already, and you will be hearing from other speakers uh, for the rest of this session, we have many challenges. Climate change, environmental issues, overfishing, piracy, natural resource extraction, militarisation, and um, restrictions on freedom of movement. And how we maintain peaceful economic prosperity and security today and into the future is the topic of this panel discussion today. Thank you. So my first question is for uh, Dr. Jalal. And my question is that given that Indonesia sits at the centre of the Indo-Pacific region, or as Professor Blacksland today called it, the fulcrum, um, and is at a, a key transit route for engine, engine energy supplies and other shipping heading to and from Southeast Asia. So can you please uh, discuss with us how Indonesia and more broadly ASEAN view the requirements for security in our region? Okay, well, thank you. First, I want to say thank you to the, the, the wonderful speech by uh, my good friend, uh, Senator uh, Penny Wong, and also the earlier speech by Julie Bishop. And I also want to congratulate uh, Gordon Flake for bringing the Indozone uh, conference uh, much more glamour. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, three years ago, I, he invited me to speak. It was a uh, you know, very plain room, but now it's become very disco somehow. I don't <laughs> and I didn't, I, I didn't realize how seriously uh, Indozone took the maritime uh, theme until I realized that you even named your vice chancellor Freshwater. <laughs> 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 All right, well, uh, to answer your question, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, to, to answer your question, uh, let, let me tell you what we, we worried about. Uh, we're seri seeing a, a trend of a serious naval buildup by key countries. Uh, obviously, President Trump has talked about building the U.S. naval fleet in the Pacific and to back to the level of 1998. Um, China is talking about, or not just talking about building a blue ocean navy uh, and aims to have like 500 navy ships by 2030. Um, Japan uh, has the fifth most powerful navy in the world and is seeking expanded role. Russia uh, is uh, again, uh, building or rebuilding the Pacific fleet, and Indian Navy is becoming more active. Now, what worries us is this is going to create a geostrategic condensation mm. in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's not so much the naval buildup that we're worried about, but it's the fact that all this is happening in a global geopolitical environment where there seems to be more rivalry and competition and strategic distrust than uh, cooperation and strategic trust. Uh, we're seeing, obviously, the deterioration in the relations between the major powers, between the United States and Russia, United States uh, and China, Russia and Europe, China and Japan, and, and so on. And so long as these geopolitical rivalries and tension uh, happen, they will be expressed more and more in the maritime domain. Mm -hmm. uh, like, as I said earlier, I'm not worried about naval buildup, but the strategic framework that would, within uh, which that happens. As an example, Indonesia is developing our armed forces. Mm -hmm. Singapore too, Malaysia too. But 
it's all fine between the three of us because uh, uh, the relations between the countries are, are very cooperative and very stable. Uh, there's no suspicion, right? Uh, and in fact, uh, we synergize uh, our military uh, um, uh, modernizations. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so if you ask me uh, what needs to be done, uh, I think we need to promote the uh, idea that strategic uh, developments uh, must not forget that all this must take place within a rules-based maritime and regional order. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, this is uh, becoming more challenging. Uh, all of us have been uh, in, in the signatories to UNCLOS had been urging the United States to sign on mm -hmm. uh, to ratify the UNCLOS. Right? Uh, it was a tough fight under the Obama administration. It didn't happen. And for sure, this is not going to happen under the Trump administration. Right? So we're going to see that uncertainty. But uh, on the other side as well, China, uh, we're not going to, China has signed on to uh, uh, UNCLOS, uh, but we see how China reacted to the ruling of the PCA. Yeah, uh, uh, which uh, f the Philippines filed. So we're not seeing much uh, confidence uh, in terms of having a rules-based maritime order that is so necessary for the strategic stability in the we'll, Asia. We'll come back to talk about that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, my next question is to Admiral Singh. Uh, you've Just heard- pick up the remote, okay. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's no button to stop the clock there. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> you better speak quickly. <laughs> okay. So you've just heard uh, from your Indonesian colleague uh, his perspective on uh, regional uh, naval build-up and including in India. So at the core of the idea of this Indo-Pacific maritime is based on the assumption that Indo India continues to rise as a regional and also as a global player, as we've just heard. Uh, can you perhaps share with us how India sees uh, maritime security in the region and your role? Thank you. Um, first of all, I, uh, I must uh, compliment Senator Perry Wong for having used the term, the, the phrase that security is predicated on economic progress and well-being. And that's why I have put this caption, maritime security <laughs> determines the economic landscape. In fact, instead of determines, I should have used dictates. Uh, this, there's an old adage that a combination of uh, the strategic potential or strategic power of a <coughs> nation depends on the healthy combination of military might and economic progress. The two are inter interdependent. And we are seeing more and more of uh, a case of non-traditional threats having superseded the traditional ones after the, after the end of the Cold War, and therefore, today we need to focus more on non-traditional and new traditional threats of the kind that we saw after the PCA ruling. So let me go on to answer the question first. Back to the basics, the three main oceans of this world. But you need to focus your eyes on the last one. The smallest of the three is the Indian Ocean, from where I come, and from where Perth and the west coast of Australia comes. It's only 68.8 million square kilometers. <laughs> But unlike <laughs> the, S, the, the Pacific and the Atlantic, there are no gateways. There's no access to the, to the rest of the world through the sea. You've got access within the Indo-Pacific for, for, com for commodity and product transit only through eight choke points. Just look at these. The Indian Ocean is the only ocean that has got a roof over its head, which is not a very good thing. <laughs> and why is it am I criticizing choke points? Not just because they are constrictions to navigation, to freedom of the seas, but because they provide safe havens and support and staging facilities for actors in transnational crime, be it piracy, terrorism, gun running, drug running, human trafficking, etc. And since those red lines actually, I call them strategic lines of communication, Actually, they represent oil and gas routes uh, in this part of the world. And those figures uh, tell you how many million barrels of oil transit through those choke points per day, 17.3 on an average from the Strait of Hormuz, from the Persian Gulf, 15.4 through 
through the Malacca, Sunda, or Lombok Straits. That's a huge quantity. And look at this figure of the lifeblood of the world till such time COP21 gets respected and finally we change over to renewable energy sources. Almost a billion tons of oil passes through the Indian Ocean annually. Two thirds of that passes through the Indonesian, the international transit routes, which were actually archipelagic sea lanes till the UNCLOS came into being. Criticality of these archipelagic sea lanes which have become international straits must never be lost sight of, despite Wawasan Nusantara in Indonesia. Out of those 15 million barrels per day coming through the Malacca and Lombok Straits, 11 million barrels on an average pass through South China Sea. $5.3 trillion worth of goods and commodities passes through the South China Sea. So if peace and tranquility in this part of the world, the semi-enclosed sea, which is 3.8 million square kilometers, smaller than the Arabian Sea, you can imagine, is disturbed because despite the PCA ruling last year, you're going to have a serious issue with economic progress and particularly with blue economy in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. Six trillion cubic feet of gas passes through the same area every year. Let me therefore come to the last point and that is what are the challenges that we face today? As I said in the beginning, it is non-traditional threats <laughs> that have superseded traditional threats, sidestepped them since the end of the Cold War. And in particular, what challenges the well-being or the encouragement that the world has received over the last uh, sev seven years since 2012 on the word on the term blue economy and its uh, components are firstly maritime terrorism. If every anyone thought it doesn't exist, here are the pictures. Most of them within the all of them within the Indo-Pacific. Most of them in the Indian Ocean. And the last one we faced in 2008 in Mumbai you are all aware of, we call it 2611, was terrorists who came by the sea route from Pakistan and created havoc in two iconic hotels and the most populous rail station. Piracy in the Gulf of Aden, somewhere we had never heard of. Why did it take routes over there? Because of a non-functional government, because of poverty, because of fishermen having lost their livelihood and having turned to this kind of crime. It used to be heard of as armed robbery only in the Malakas, but now it's shifted over there, and you know what Lloyd said, and you know what IMO said towards 2012. What did this incidence of piracy do in the Gulf of Aden? Those expanding circles came as close to the west coast of India as you can't imagine. 800 nautical miles, that's where skiffs and motherships of the pirates were coming. And the HRAs, the high-risk areas that were year after year promulgated by the IMO, went over land as if ships were to travel over land. What did this result in? That's the picture of a 24-hour vessel transit captures, or capture of the screenshot sitting in an ops room in the Indian Navy, looking at all the contacts that transit the east-west trade route, the most dense trade route that finally goes through or comes out of the Malacca Straits. They're hugging the coast, large ones as well as small ones. That means security of the slocks has become paramount. As if all these challenges were not enough, 70% of all the world's natural disasters strike with increasing ferocity and magnitude year after year within the Indian Ocean. 80% of all the world's natural disasters strike the Indo-Pacific. You heard of, the, you remember the tsunami of 2004 and what kind of havoc it, it wreaked. Therefore, all maritime states in the region need to be prepared for HADR with, through cooperation. <laughs> I want you to soak this picture. It just tells you that the nature of threat in today's world, non-traditional threat, <laughs> that we face and the direction in which it comes from is totally unpredictable. I didn't touch upon poaching, which is in these slides, because I had to cut out a lot of slides, because I've been given five minutes, the clock refuses to stop. But poaching and IUU is such a curse on humanity today 
that unless we get together and do something, we are going to be doomed. Biological sustenance of fish is going to be not possible. Therefore, I say when you've got glamorous mechanisms in this part of the world, starting with IORA, IONS, WPNS, ARF, there, there, are, there are scores of them. Why can't we have horizontal and vertical linkages for information sharing? There's nothing secret in today's world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that uh, <coughs> oversight of all of the issues that we've been discussing here today. I think there's only one person that might take issue with that last slide about the threats, and that's Professor Mewing about uh, the shark attack. But uh, now I'll move on to Vice Admiral Coda. And so if you've just heard uh, from the two of your colleagues, and I'm wondering if you could share with us how Japan sees the many challenges and opportunities in the region. Yeah, uh, you know, today our focus is maritime domain. So, but maritime domain, it's very difficult to understand. I think many people in this morning mentioned. For me, I have been in marriage for 42 years, <laughs> but I still have difficulty in fully understanding my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I spent 40 years in Japanese Navy and spent 19 years at sea. Every year, about 200 days a year at sea. But still, ocean or maritime domain is very difficult. And, but in this, you know, the very difficult to understand maritime domain, there are several things that has not changed since the beginning of the human being's history. The, the, the first is the free use of the high sea. Since the beginning of the human's history, in, back in the Greek or the Phoenician days, starting from the coastal navigation to the regional to the ocean navigation, Today's human prosperity, or our, our, our community, the f free shipping has been one of the largest element of the human being's success. And we see this, the free use of the high sea, is the universal principle or the paramount value for human beings. And no one should challenge by any means. And today, uh, unfortunately, there are several groups of nations or the, the entities which challenges this universal principle. And if this is the case, I think the like-minded nation should be prepared to take care of that challenge. That is the one thing. And today, I think time is running out, so I make my story a little short. And second is the, the, the pretty, you know, the frequent the territorial dispute, especially in the South China Sea, for example. And Japan or United States are often said, you are geo outsiders. So you have no right to say anything. Yes, we are geo outsiders. So territorial dispute is the matter for the nations concerned, or matter for the coastal nations. So at least it is very clear for Japan to keep the neutrality. Japan will not support any nation. For example, not Vietnam, not Philippines, or not China. We are neutral. But that, at the same time, two conditions. One, if any single member tries to use the military power to solve the problem, that will be a big challenge for the peace and stability. So Japan will be prepared. And second, also the free use of the high sea even in the South China Sea, we should make larger part of the South China Sea not an area where the single nations, the jurisdiction will be in effect. No domestic law should be applied in the high sea. So even the nation like the Vatican or Switzerland or Mongolia, where there is no seawater surrounding their countries, even those nations without sea, they have the right to say. And th this is the, the Japanese very clear position. And making those two fundamental values as a principle, Japan is ready to talk to any nations concerned. And if we'll be successful, 
our future will be prosperous and successful, that crowd will cast over our future. Thank you. And now, Professor Shen, uh, as China's grown in economic strength, it's also increased its capacity to project military power. I'm just wondering if you could describe for us, please, how, how would you describe China's maritime security policies? Well, uh, security, as uh, Professor John uh, Flex, uh, Black's land and uh, Professor Junai uh, mentioned, is oxygen. You know, we have to take every second. We appreciate this opportunity to take oxygen uh, that America provided during the Second World War uh, to counter uh, the aggression of some country. We are beneficiary of such a partnership. And uh, with China's economic growth, uh, we export tremendously uh, lately. From the three years in a row, from 2013 to 2015, China was the number one exporter of goods. We used tremend tremendously amount of Indo-Pacific uh, area. And again, we are beneficiary of the oxygen American provided, stability. American Navy in the region help us to counter uh, uh, piracy. And we also appreciate Indian. Indian Navy, your Navy helped us to beat piracy. So we benefited from the oxygen taking. And we thought we should also contribute oxygen to the, the community of nations. So we send our Navy uh, 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 fleet to the Gulf of Eden for 26 batches, each for three uh, <coughs> boats, two uh, surface combatants, one refueling uh, uh, ship. But uh, it's a kind of uh, uh, awkward. Each time you bring this uh, logistic ship all together for almost 10 years. So finally, we altered our security notion that to do have overseas base is aggressive. We see Japan, Indian, US have their uh, naval installations in Djibouti. Why we could not have one? So we start to apply for one. And Djibouti graciously accepted China's application. And we pay a fee. Then kick, they can kick uh, us out at any time. But they are great in accepting us. This allows us, China, to refuel uh, our ships more readily, which on one occasion we used to take our uh, people, our workers, who were uh, uh, stricken in a war-torn area. And our Navy need to be there to take our people out. And incidentally, as the governments of other countries, of other uh, uh, people who were uh, uh, stricken there were not uh, saved. Incidentally, we took other citizens out. So we start to change our old mentality. To have aircraft carrier means aggression. Maybe. Uh, maybe not. Uh, we should bind our hand not to be aggressive, but not, to, not to, because we don't have the means to be aggressive. We start to change our mentality. We start to have our first one aircraft carrier to second one and probably the third one. And over time, we start to be a contributor to the oxygen uh, in addition to taking oxygen. And we uh, created the new idea of one belt, one load, belt and load initiative to help our, our neighbors to have the infrastructure inter, uh, connectivity. So we help Malaysia and the Philippines. They think, is this China's good behavior? So I can put uh, 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 land reclam reclamation uh, on shelf for a while. Let's build the econ economy together. And over time, China may reflect and may be more willing to, be, to abide by the CPA ruling. So they have their idea, economic first, 
China has its idea, economy first. Meantime, we try to make an arrangement with Japan for Diaoyu Island slash Senkaku. So the two Navy, two Air Force would have the rule of courtesy. When they meet, they should call in English. They should not report to the boss in the first place. She should meet and call to allow uh, a, a space to avoid a crisis. So we cannot say there will, there will be no crisis between China and Japan, but we have far less chance to collide this time than uh, what would be four or five years ago. And my government is committed to working out something which is called the South China Sea uh, Code of Conduct, COC, not merely DOC, probably sometime later in the year, in which we would commit legally to be bound not to use military means to settle interstate dispute. To settle interstate dis dispute on the ground of sovereignty is not illegal. Every country is bound to have the right to not to report to the UN, but to use military means to defend its sovereignty. It's our sovereignty. But we are willing to abandon our sovereignty to say no war, no use of force, once the DOC is cut, 10 plus 1. This is an innovation of diplomacy, innovation for a better future in South China Sea. But the land dispute, the fishery dispute is still there. But at least we commit, we are not going to use the UN Charter to settle our dispute. We are willing to use friendship to build our uh, uh, respect. So China would help the Philippines to fish. They would put the PCA uh, ruling uh, uh, in suspension for a while. Thank you, Professor Chen. I think we'll thank you very much for your opening thank you. comments. Thank you. I'd like to now um, turn to an open question for all of the panelists. And the question is for all of our five countries and all of the other countries uh, in the zone, how do we make sure that um, territorial disputes in the in maritime uh, domain don't interfere with our economic development and with the free transport and transfer of goods. Who would like to, to kick off some further reflections on this? Uh, let me just uh, mention uh, one or two points. Uh, first, uh, le uh, let me say what we're not going to see. What we're not going to see is the resolution of the territorial disputes in the near future. Uh, this is because uh, some of the claimants uh, have not specified their claims, including China themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, there is no political will by any of the claimants to actually sit down at the table and resolve it, even though rhetorically they claim uh, they do so. Uh, and the second point is, uh, I know in the declaration of uh, uh, Code of Conduct uh, or guidelines, they mentioned something about joint development mm -hmm. uh, for the claimant countries. But I want to say that uh, we in Indonesia tried since the 1990s to get the claimant countries to enter into any kind of joint development activities. And in the last almost uh, more than 20 years or so, uh, we haven't succeeded. Uh, I mean, the Indonesian workshop demonstrated that all the claimants speak about joint development, but when we said, okay, let's do it, everybody has their guards up and especially it will not happen on hydrocarbons, uh, which is w where the most sensitive issues uh, happen. Mm -hmm. And the, the last thing is, uh, I'm very interested in what the professor said, that uh, the uh, code of conduct will be finalized mm -hmm. at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. But I should say, look, uh, the South China Sea is a long game. The declaration on the uh, conduct of the South China Sea took place in 2002. <laughs> the guidelines took place in 2012, right? 10 years. And the framework, right, happened in 2017, five years later. I'm very interested how this is going to happen two or three months from now, right? So. would you want to, you're nodding in agreement with the comment? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yes, uh, end of the code of conduct, like the uh, code of declaration in 2002. It's not a remedy to solve the problem. But practical thing for Japan can do is to keep the United States as a supervisor of the area, 
not the direct, the principal member to act. But at least regional nations, nations <laughs> alone, they are very weak relative to China. So if we lose the presence of the US forces, perhaps the game will be over, unfavorable to the, the, the regional nations. So Japan's role in practical way is to keep the US presence as much as possible. And that is the Japan's role. And that, that's why Japan is doing our best effort to keep the US here. Not to fight against China, but to supervise and monitor the situation. And if anything, the self-rightist maneuver by China would happen, we'll be ready to take pressure on the Chinese side and to, to suppress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we've got a question here for uh, Vice Admiral Singh. Uh, given the large number of natural disasters in the Indian Ocean and the unplanned pressure points, migration and potential conflicts these disasters uh, can trigger, I'm wondering if you've got any further comments, uh, Admiral, on, on this particular issue. Uh, given the large number of natural disasters in the Indian Ocean and the unplanned pressure points, migration and potential conflicts, these are, I, I think the question is not yet complete. But um, before it is... Perhaps uh, on, on Admiral Coder's uh, comments uh, yes. about the role of the United States, what is yes. his perspective on this? I think that's a much healthier question to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make one thing clear. Firstly, Ladies and gentlemen, particularly someone who's put that question out of the students, it is important for you to understand the ocean is not territorial. Does it make sense? You cannot have territorial disputes in the water. Secondly, the last time anyone drew a line in the ocean dividing the waters or containing the waters was in the Roman Empire. That ended in 117 AD. Third point, if all nations were to follow the principle of drawing lines and claiming waters as their own, then the British map of 1914 should be picked up by the UK, and the entire world will be drawn in about 100 dashes. And you and I will have to go to the Arctic or the Antarctica. Therefore, if there's something called ocean governance, it starts with everyone who has ratified or at least signed the law of the sea treaty to abide by it. I feel like saying that the law of the sea treaty should be called by the initials of that term as an acronym, LOST. <laughs> and that's how we will continue to have rulings and thereafter the follow-on um, process that is on at the moment. Thank you. Now we are running out of time and we've got this question here from Andrew at All Saints College which I will open up as the last, uh, last question. But uh, what is the most realistic way to diffuse the growing state of tension between our countries in the region? And I was wondering, um, having a look at the response to MH370 where 14 countries came together based here in Perth and cooperated uh, in this project, is that something a model that we could develop to keep the peace and also to uh, look after our economic interests. So, <coughs> Professor. Uh, there are a lot to do. For instance, building infrastructure collaboratively. Philippines, mm. Malaysia certainly have interest. And actually that kind of joint program would threat the prosperity of Singapore because Singapore uh, provides all energy for fueling uh, those ocean liner. If uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Fili uh, Philippines would also have a capacity under China support, Singapore may be threatened. But that is a benign threat that Singapore cannot refuse. So this is the kind of thing China is offering. It's not a, not a military threat, it's a threat to uh, 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 enhance the economic uh, uh, partnership and cooperation. No one should refuse China's offer. Secondly, when China says, I'm the biggest use of the ocean for my uh, commercial shipping, 
how I can be a threat to the freedom of navigation. In addition to China's rhetoric, could China and other country work with China to joint police patrol uh, to, to do the regional uh, police work to contain uh, challenges uh, to international uh, sh uh, free shipping? Uh, our collaborative work in the UN framework in the Gulf of Eden is such an uh, is, uh, a case, but we can do a lot. China-Indian joint policing, China-Japan, uh, we should not only compete in a healthy, co constructive way, but we should also uh, collaborate uh, to make the region secure. So Japan would feel China is a rising benign power, not uh, an, a monster and aggressive. Thank you very much. And unfortunately, we'll have to end it here. So look, I'd like to say thank you very much to all of our panelists uh, here today. I'm sure all of you will have some fascinating follow-on conversations with our panellists over lunch and through the course of the afternoon. But I think is what is very clear is that without uh, security in our, in our seas and keeping our channels of uh, lines of communication open, there will be no economic uh, prosperity and no peace. So thank you very much uh, for all of you here today. Thank you. Thank you.